Chapter Fourteen of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Metzler. Masters of Arts. A two-inch stub of a blue pencil was the wand with which Keo performed the preliminary acts of his magic. So, with this, he covered paper with diagrams and figures, while he awaited for the United States of America to send down to Coralio a successor to Atwood, resigned. The new scheme that his mind had conceived, his stout heart endorsed, and his blue pencil corroborated, was laid around the characteristics and human frailties of the new president of Anchuria. These characteristics, and the situation out of which Keogh hoped to wrest a golden tribute, deserve chronically contributive to the clear order of events. President Losada, many called him dictator, was a man whose genius would have made him conspicuous even among Anglo-Saxons, had not that genius been intermixed with other traits that were petty and subversive. He had some of the lofty patriotism of Washington, the man he most admired, the force of Napoleon, and much of the wisdom of the sages. These characteristics might have justified him in the assumption of the title of the illustrious liberator, had they not been accompanied by a stupendous and amazing vanity that kept him in the less worthy ranks of the dictators. Yet he did his country great service. With a mighty grasp he shook it nearly free from the shackles of ignorance and sloth and the vermin that fed upon it, and all but made it a power in the consul of nations. He established schools and hospitals, built roads, bridges, railroads, and palaces, and bestowed generous subsidies upon the arts and sciences. He was the absolute despot and the idol of his people. The wealth of the country poured into his hands. Other presidents had been rapacious without reason. Losada amassed enormous wealth, but his people had their share of the benefits. The joint in his armor was his insatiate passion for monuments and tokens commemorating his glory. In every town he caused to be erected statues of himself bearing legends in praise of his greatness. In the walls of every public edifice, tablets were fixed reciting his splendor and the gratitude of his subjects. His statuettes and portraits were scattered throughout the land in every house and hut. One of the sycophants in his court painted him as St. John, with a halo and a train of attendants in full uniform. Losada saw nothing in Congress in this picture, and had it hung in a church in the capital. He ordered from a French sculptor a marble group including himself with Napoleon, Alexander the Great, and one or two others whom he deemed worthy of the honor. He ransacked Europe for decorations, employing policy, money, and intrigue to cajole the orders he coveted from kings and rulers. On state occasions his breast was covered from shoulder to shoulder with crosses, stars, golden roses, medals, and ribbons. It was said that the man who could contrive for him a new decoration, or invent some new method of extolling his greatness, might plunge a hand deep into the treasury. This was the man upon whom Billy Keel had his eye. The gentle buccaneer had observed the rain of favors that fell upon those who ministered to the president's vanities, and he did not deem it his duty to hoist his umbrella against the scattering drops of liquid fortune. In a few weeks the new consul arrived, releasing Keogh from his temporary duties. It was a young man fresh from college who lived for botany alone. The consul at Coralio gave him the opportunity to study tropical flora. He wore smoked glasses and carried a green umbrella. He filled the cool back porch of the consulate with plants and specimens, so that the space for a bottle and chair was not to be found. Keogh gazed on him sadly, but without rancor and began to pack his gripsack. For his new plot against stagnation along the Spanish main required of him a voyage overseas. Soon came the Carlsofen again, she of the trampish habits, gleaning a cargo of coconuts for a speculative descent upon the New York market. Keogh was booked for a passage on the return trip. "'Yes, I'm going to New York,' he explained to the group of his countrymen that had gathered on the beach to see him off but I'll be back before you miss me. I've undertaken the art education of this piebald country, and I'm not the man to desert it while it's in the early throes of tintypes. With this mysterious declaration of his intentions, Keogh boarded the Carlsofen. 
Ten days later, shivering, with the collar of his thin coat turned high, he burst into the studio of Carolus White at the top of a tall building in Tenth Street, New York City. Carolus White was smoking a cigarette and frying sausages over an oil stove. He was only twenty-three, and had noble theories about art. "'Billy Keo!' exclaimed White, extending the hand that was not busy with the frying pan. "'From what part of the uncivilized world, I wonder?' "'Hello, Carrie,' said Keo, dragging forward a stool, and holding his fingers close to the stove. "'I'm glad I found you so soon. I've been looking for you all day in the directories and art galleries. The free lunch man on the corner told me where you were quick. I was sure you'd be painting pictures yet.' Keo glanced about the studio with the shrewd eye of a connoisseur in business. "'Yes, you can do it,' he declared with many gentle nods of his head. "'That big one in the corner with the angels and green clouds and bandwagon is just the sort of thing we want. What would you call that, Carrie? Seen from Coney Island, ain't it?' "'That,' said White, "'I had intended to call the translation of Elijah, but you may be nearer right than I am.' "'Name doesn't matter,' said Keogh, largely. "'It's the frame and the varieties of paint that does the trick. "'Now I can tell you in a minute what I want. "'I've come on a little voyage of two thousand miles "'to take you in with me on a scheme. "'I thought of you as soon as the scheme showed itself to me. "'How would you like to go back with me and paint a picture? Ninety days for the trip, and five thousand dollars for the job.' "'Cereal food or hair tonic posters?' asked White. It isn't an ad. What kind of picture is it to be? It's a long story, said Keogh. Go ahead with it. If you don't mind, while you talk, I'll just keep my eyes on these sausages. Let them get one shade deeper than a Van Dyke brown, and you spoil them. Keogh explained his project. They were to return to Coralio, where White was to pose as a distinguished American portrait painter who was touring in the tropics as a relaxation from his arduous and remunerative professional labors. It was not an unreasonable hope, even to those who had trod in the beaten paths of business, that an artist with so much prestige might secure a commission to perpetuate upon canvas the lineaments of the president, and secure a share of the pesos that were raining upon the caterers to his weaknesses. Keogh had set his price at ten thousand dollars. Artists had been paid more for portraits. He and White were to share the expenses of the trip, and divide the possible profits. Thus he laid the scheme before White, whom he had known in the West before one declared for art, and the other became a Bedouin. Before long the two machinators abandoned the rigor of the bare studio for a snug corner of a café. There they sat far into the night, with old envelopes and keel stub of blue pencil between them. At twelve o'clock White doubled up in his chair with his chin on his fist, and shut his eyes at the unbeautiful wallpaper. "'I'll go you, Billy,' he said in the quiet tones of decision. "'I've got two or three hundred saved up for sausages and rent, and I'll take the chance with you. Five thousand! It will give me two years in Paris and one in Italy. I'll begin to pack tomorrow. "'You'll begin in ten minutes,' said Keogh. "'It's tomorrow now.' The Carlsvin starts back at four p.m. Come on to your painting shop, and I'll help you. For five months in the year Coralio is the new port of Anchuria. Then only does the town possess life. From November to March it is practically the seat of government. The president with his official family sojourns there, and society follows him. The pleasure-loving people make the season one long holiday of amusement and rejoicing. Fiestas, balls, games, sea-bathing, Processions and small theatres contribute to their enjoyment. The famous Swiss band from the capital plays in the little plaza every evening, while the fourteen carriages and vehicles in the town circle in funereal but complacent procession. Indians from the interior mountains, looking like prehistoric stone idols, come down to peddle their handiwork in the streets. The people throng the narrow ways, a chattering, happy, careless stream of buoyant humanity preposterous children rigged out with the shortest of ballet skirts and gilt wings howl underfoot among the effervescent crowds especially is the arrival of the presidential party at the opening of the season attended with pomp show and patriotic demonstrations of enthusiasm and delight when keogh and white reached their destination on the return trip of the carlsefin 
the gay winter season was well begun. As they stepped upon the beach they could hear the band playing in the plaza. The village maidens, with fireflies already fixed in their dark locks, were gliding, barefoot and coy-eyed, along the paths. Dandies in white linen, swinging their canes, were beginning their seductive strolls. The air was full of human essence, of artificial enticement, of coquetry, indolence, pleasure, the man-made sense of existence. The first two or three days after their arrival were spent in preliminaries. Keo escorted the artist about town, introducing him to the little circle of English-speaking residents and pulling whatever wires he could to effect the spreading of White's fame as a painter. Then Keo planned a more spectacular demonstration of the idea he wished to keep before the public. He and White engaged rooms in the Hotel de los Estrangeros. The two were clad in new suits of immaculate duck, with American straw hats, and carried canes of remarkable uniqueness and inutility. Few caballeros in Colario, even the gorgeously uniformed officers of the Anchurian army, were as conspicuous for ease and elegance of demeanor as Keo and his friend, the great American painter, Senor White. White set up his easel on the beach and made striking sketches of the mountain and sea views. The native population formed at his rear in a vast, chattering semicircle to watch his work. Kyo, with his care for details, had arranged for himself a pose which he carried out with fidelity. His role was that of friend to the great artist, a man of affairs and leisure. The visible emblem of his position was a pocket camera. For branding the man who owns it, said he, a genteel dilettante with a bank account and an easy conscience, a steam yacht ain't in it with a camera. You see a man doing nothing but loafing around making snapshots, and you know right away he reads up well in Bradstreet. You notice these old millionaire boys. Soon as they get through taking everything else in sight, they go to taking photographs. People are more interested by a Kodak than they are by a title or a four-carat scarf-pin. So Kio strolled blandly about Coralio, snapping the scenery in the shrinking senoritas, while White posed conspicuously in the higher regions of art. Two weeks after their arrival, the scheme began to bear fruit. An aide-de-camp of the president drove to the hotel in a dashing Victoria. The president desired that Senor White come to the Casa Morena for an informal interview. Keo gripped his pipe tightly between his teeth. "'Not a cent less than ten thousand, he said to the artist. "'Remember the price. And in gold or its equivalent. Don't let him stick you with this bargain-counter stuff they call money here.' "'Perhaps it isn't what he wants,' said White. "'Get out,' said Keogh, with splendid confidence. "'I know what he wants. He wants his picture painted by the celebrated young American painter and filibuster now sojourning in his downtrodden country. Off you go.' The Victoria sped away with the artist. Keogh walked up and down, puffing great clouds of smoke from his pipe, and waited. In an hour the Victoria swept again to the door of the hotel, deposited White, and vanished. The artist dashed up the stairs, three at a step. Keo stopped smoking, and became a silent interrogation point. "'Landed!' exclaimed White, with his boyish face flushed with elation. "'Billy, you are a wonder. He wants a picture. I'll tell you all about it. By heavens! That dictator chap is a corker. He's a dictator clear down to his finger-ends. He's a kind of combination of Julius Caesar, Lucifer, and Chauncey Depew done in sepia.' polite and grim, that's his way. The room I saw him in was about ten acres big, and looked like a Mississippi steamboat with its gilding and mirrors and white paint. He talks English better than I can ever hope to. The matter of the price came up. I mentioned ten thousand. I expected him to call the guard and have me taken out and shot. He didn't move an eyelash. He just waved one of his chestnut hands in a careless way and said, "'Whatever you say,' I am to go back to-morrow and discuss with him the details of the picture." Keo hung his head. Self-abasement was easy to read in his downcast countenance. "'I'm failing, Carrie,' he said sorrowfully. "'I'm not fit to handle these man-sized schemes any longer. Peddling oranges in a pushcart is about the suitable graft for me. When I said ten thousand I swear I thought I had sized up that brown man's limit to within two cents. He'd have melted down for fifteen thousand just as easy. Say, Carrie, 
You'll see old man Keogh safe in some nice, quiet idiot asylum, won't you, if he makes a break like that again? The Casa Morena, although only one story in height, was a building of brown stone, luxurious as a palace in its interior. It stood on a low hill in a walled garden of splendid tropical flora at the upper edge of Coralio. The next day the president's carriage came again for the artist. Keogh went out for a walk along the beach, where he and his picture-box were now familiar sights. When he returned to the hotel, White was sitting in a steamer chair on the balcony. Well, said Keogh, did you and his nibs decide on the kind of a chromo he wants? White got up and walked back and forth on the balcony a few times. Then he stopped and laughed strangely. His face was flushed, and his eyes were bright with a kind of angry amusement. "'Look here, Billy,' he said, somewhat roughly. "'When you first came to me in my studio and mentioned a picture, I thought you wanted a smashed oats or a hair-tonic poster painted on a range of mountains or the side of a continent. Well, either of those jobs would have been art in its highest form compared to the one you've steered me against. I can't paint that picture, Billy. You've got to let me out. Let me try to tell you what that barbarian wants. He had it all planned out and even a sketch made of his idea. The old boy doesn't draw badly at all. But ye goddesses of art, listen to the monstrosity he expects me to paint. He wants himself in the centre of the canvas, of course. He is to be painted as Jupiter sitting on Olympus, with the clouds at his feet. At one side of him stands George Washington, in full regimentals, with his hand on the President's shoulder. An angel with outstretched wings hovers overhead, and is placing a laurel wreath on the President's head, crowning him, Queen of the May, I suppose. In the background is to be cannon, more angels and soldiers. The man who would paint that picture would have to have the soul of a dog, and would deserve to go down into oblivion without even a tin can tied to his tail to sound his memory. Little beads of moisture crept out all over Billy Keogh's brow. The stub of his blue pencil had not figured out a contingency like this. The machinery of his plan had run with flattering smoothness until now. He dragged another chair upon the balcony and got White back to his seat. He lit his pipe with apparent calm. "'Now, Sonny,' he said, with gentle grimness, "'you and me will have an art-to-art -art talk. You've got your art, and I've got mine. Yours is the real Pyrian stuff that turns up its nose at Bach beer signs and oleographs of the old mill. Mine's the art of business. This was my scheme, and it worked out like two and two. Paint that president man as old King Cole.' or Venus, or landscape, or fresco, or a bunch of lilies, or anything he thinks he looks like. But get the paint on the canvas and collect the spoils. You wouldn't throw me down, Carrie, at this stage of the game. Think of that ten thousand. I can't help thinking of it, said White, and that's what hurts. I'm tempted to throw every ideal I ever had down in the mire and steep my soul in infamy by painting that picture. That five thousand means three years of foreign study to me, and I'd almost sell my soul for that. Now, it ain't as bad as that, said Keogh soothingly. It's a business proposition. It's so much paint and time against money. I don't fall in with your idea that that picture would so everlastingly jolt the art side of the question. George Washington was all right, you know, and nobody could say a word against the angel. I don't think so bad of that group. If you was to give Jupiter a pair of epaulets and a sword, and kind of work the clouds around to look like a blackberry patch, it wouldn't make such a bad battle scene. Why, if we hadn't already settled on the price, you ought to pay an extra thousand for Washington, and the angel ought to raise it five hundred. "'You don't understand, Billy,' said White, with an uneasy laugh. "'Some of us fellows who try to paint have big notions about art. I wanted to paint a picture some day that people would stand before and forget that it was made of paint.' I wanted it to creep into them like a bar of music and mushroom there like a soft bullet. And I wanted him to go away and ask, What else has he done? And I didn't want him to find a thing. Not a portrait, nor a magazine cover, nor an illustration, nor a drawing of a girl. Nothing but THE picture. That's why I've lived on fried sausages, and tried to keep true to myself. I persuaded myself to do this portrait for the chance it might give me to study abroad. But this howling, screaming caricature! Good Lord! Can't you see how it is? Sure, said Keogh, as tenderly as he would have spoken to a child, and he laid a long forefinger on White's knee. 
I see. It's bad to have your art all slugged up like that. I know. You wanted to paint a big thing like the panorama of the Battle of Gettysburg. But let me calcimine you a little mental sketch to consider. Up to date we're at $385.50 on this scheme. Our capital took every cent both of us could raise. We've got about enough left to get back to New York on. I need my share of that 10000 I want to work a copper deal in Idaho and make a 100000 That's the business end of the thing. Come down off your art perch, Carrie, and let's land that hat full of dollars. Billy, said White, with an effort, I'll try. I won't say I'll do it, but I'll try. I'll go at it and put it through if I can. That's business, said Keogh heartily. Good boy. Now here's another thing. Rush that picture. Crowd it through as quick as you can. Get a couple of boys to help you mix the paint if necessary. I've picked up some pointers around town. The people here are beginning to get sick of Mr. President. They say he's been too free with concessions, and they accuse him of trying to make a dicker with England to sell out the country. We want that picture done and paid for before there's any row. In the great patio of Casa Morena, the President caused to be stretched a huge canvas. Under this white set up his temporary studio. For two hours each day the great man sat to him. White worked faithfully, but as the work progressed he had seasons of bitter scorn, of infinite self-contempt, of sullen gloom and sardonic gaiety. Keogh, with the patience of a great general, soothed, coaxed, argued, kept him at the picture. At the end of a month White announced that the picture was completed. Jupiter, Washington, angels, clouds, cannon and all. His face was pale and his mouth drawn straight when he told Keogh. He said the President was much pleased with it. It was to be hung in the National Gallery of Statesmen and Heroes. The artist had been requested to return to Casa Morena on the following day to receive payment. At the appointed time he left the hotel, silent under his friend's joyful talk of their success. An hour later he walked into the room where Keogh was waiting, threw his hat on the floor, and sat upon the table. "'Billy,' he said, in strained and laboring tones, "'I've a little money out west in a small business that my brother is running. "'It's what I've been living on while I've been studying art. "'I'll draw out my share and pay you back what you've lost in the scheme.' "'Lost!' exclaimed Keogh, jumping up. "'Didn't you get paid for the picture?' "'Yes, I got paid,' said White. "'But just now there isn't any picture, and there isn't any pay. "'If you care to hear about it, here are the edifying details. "'The President and I were looking at the painting.' His secretary brought a bank draft on New York for ten thousand dollars and handed it to me. The moment I touched it I went wild. I tore it into little pieces and threw them on the floor. A workman was repainting the pillars inside the patio, a bucket of his paint happening to be convenient. I picked up his brush and slapped a quart of blue paint all over that ten thousand dollar nightmare. I bowed and walked out. The president didn't move or speak. That was one time he was taken by surprise. It's tough on you, Billy, but I couldn't help it. There seemed to be excitement in Coralio. Outside there was a confused, rising murmur pierced by high-pitched cries. Bajo el traidor! Muerte el traidor! were the words they seemed to form. Listen to that! exclaimed White, bitterly. I know that much Spanish. They're shouting, Down with the traitor! I heard them before. I felt that they meant me. I was a traitor to art. The picture had to go down with the blank fool would have suited your case better said keogh with fiery emphasis you tear up ten thousand dollars like an old rag because the way you've spread on five dollars worth of paint hurts your conscience next time i pick a side partner in a scheme the man has got to go before a notary and swear he never even heard the word ideal mentioned keogh strode from the room white hot white paid little attention to his resentment the scorn of Billy Keogh seemed a trifling thing beside the greater self-scorn he had escaped. In Corralio the excitement waxed. An outburst was imminent. The cause of this demonstration of displeasure was the presence in the town of a big, pink-cheeked Englishman, who, it was said, was an agent of his government come to clinch the bargain by which the President placed his people in the hands of a foreign power. It was charged that not only had he given away priceless concessions, but that the public debt was to be transferred into the hands of the English, and the customs houses turned over to them as a guarantee. The long-enduring people had determined to make their protest felt. 
On that night in Coralio and in other towns the ire found vent. Yelling mobs, mercurial but dangerous, roamed the streets. They overthrew the great bronze statue of the president that stood in the center of the plaza and hacked it to shapeless pieces. They tore from public buildings the tablets that sat there proclaiming the glory of the illustrious liberator. His pictures in the government offices were demolished. The mobs even attacked the Casa Morena, but were driven away by the military, which remained faithful to the executive. All the night terror reigned. The greatness of Losada was shown by the fact that by noon the next day order was restored, and he was still absolute. He issued proclamations denying positively that any negotiations of any kind had been entered into with England. Sir Stafford Vaughan, the pink-cheeked Englishman, also declared in placards and in public print that his presence there had no international significance. He was a traveller without guile. In fact, so he stated, he had not even spoken with the president or been in his presence since his arrival. During this disturbance, White was preparing for his homeward voyage in the steamship that was to sail within two or three days. About noon, Keo, the restless, took his camera out with the hope of speeding the lagging hours. The town was now as quiet as if peace had never departed from her perch on the red-tiled roofs. About the middle of the afternoon, Keo hurried back to the hotel with something decidedly special in his ear. He retired to the little room where he developed his pictures. Later on, he came out to White on the balcony, with a luminous, grim, predatory smile on his face. "'Do you know what that is?' he asked, holding up a four times five photograph mounted on cardboard. Snapshot of a senorita sitting in the sand, alliteration unintentional, guessed White lazily. Wrong, said Keogh with shining eyes. It's a slung shot. It's a can of dynamite. It's a gold mine. It's a sight draft on your president man for twenty thousand dollars. Yes, sir, twenty thousand this time, and no spoiling the picture. No ethics of art in the way. Art, you with your smelly little tubes. I've got you skinned to death with a Kodak. Take a look at that." White took the picture in his hand and gave a long whistle. "'Jove!' he exclaimed. "'But wouldn't that stir up a row in town if you let it be seen? How in the world did you get it, Billy?' "'Do you know that high wall around the President Man's back garden? I was up there trying to get a bird's eye of the town. I happened to notice a chink in the wall where a stone and a lot of plaster had slid out. Thinks I, I'll take a peep through to see how Mr. President's cabbages are growing. The first thing I saw was him and this Sir Englishman sitting at a little table about twenty feet away. They had the table all spread over with documents, and they were hobnobbing over them as thick as two pirates. It was a nice corner of the garden, all private and shady with palms and orange trees, and they had a pail of champagne set by handy in the grass. I knew then was the time for me to make my big hit in art. So I raised the machine up to the crack, and pressed the button. Just as I did so, them the old boys shook hands on the deal. You see, they took that way in the picture. Keo put on his coat and hat. "'What are you going to do with it?' asked White. "'Me?' said Keo in a hurt tone. "'Why, I'm going to tie a pink ribbon to it and hang it on the whatnot, of course. I'm surprised at you. But while I'm out, you just try to figure out what ginger cake potentate would be most likely to want to buy this work of art for his private collection, just to keep it out of circulation. The sunset was reddening the tops of the coconut palms when Billy Keo came back from Casa Morena. He nodded to the artist's questioning gaze, and lay down on a cot with his hands under the back of his head. I saw him. He paid the money like a little man. They didn't want to let me in at first. I told him it was important. Yes, that president man is on the plentiable list. He's got a beautiful business system about the way he uses his brains. All I had to do was to hold up the photograph so he could see it, and name the price. He just smiled, and walked over to a safe and got the cash. Twenty one thousand dollar brand new United States Treasury notes he laid on the table, like I'd pay out a dollar and a quarter. Fine notes, too. They crackled with a sound like burning the brush off a ten-acre lot. "'Let's try the feel of one,' said White, curiously. "'I never saw a ten-thousand-dollar bill.' 
Keogh did not immediately respond. Carry, he said in an absent-minded way, "'you think a heap of your art, don't you?' "'More,' said White frankly, "'than has been for the financial good of myself and my friends.' "'I thought you were a fool the other day,' went on Keogh quietly, "'and I'm not sure now that you wasn't. "'But if you was, so am I. "'I've been in some funny deals, Carry, "'but I've always managed to scramble fair "'and match my brains and capital against the other fellows. "'But when it comes to... "'Well, when you've got the other fellow singed "'and the screws on him, "'and he's got to put up, "'why, it don't strike me as being a man's game. "'They've got a name for it, you know. "'It's... "'Confound you, don't you understand? "'A fellow feels it's something like that blamed art of yours. "'He, well, I tore that photograph up "'and laid the pieces on that stack of money "'and shoved the whole business back across the table. "'Excuse me, Mr. Losada,' I said, "'but I guess I've made a mistake in the price. "'You get the photo for nothing. "'Now, Kerry, you get out the pencil "'and we'll do some more figuring. "'I'd like to save enough out of our capital "'for you to have some fried sausages in your joint "'when you get back to New York.' End of chapter 14. Recording by Eric Metzler. Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America.